All right, great. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're here today to talk about DevSecOps and our lessons learned concerning security into a DevOps world. Um, my name is Scott Schwann. I'm the director of cloud engineering for the unified commerce platform at Starbucks. Uh, I've been working in infrastructure and security for about 15 years. I actually grew up around here uh, in Westchester, PA, and I went to Drexel down the street. Um, so I'm really happy to be home. I got to spend Easter with my family, so that was, uh, that was great as well. Um, I'm the former head of infrastructure and security at a, um, at a mobile order and pay and loyalty solution startup out of uh, San Francisco called Card Free. Um, when we worked at that startup, we built out the underlying platform that actually supports uh, Taco Bell, Sonic, Checkers, Pete's Coffee, and Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, so that platform uh, actually supports close to 80 million uh, to 100 million consumers um, and is still running strong uh, supporting Dunkin' Donuts. Um, I've been assessing uh, PCI and implementing PCI compliant environments since before it was PCI. Uh, strangely enough, I actually did the first Visa KISP assessment for Wawa, uh, so I'm pretty proud of that because I love Wawa. Um, and, and currently we're building a team of DevOps engineers and um, DevSecOps engineer professionals, and we're building out this platform for Starbucks that we're going to be talking to you about today. Cool. Um, so my name is Matt Wells. I'm the manager of cloud engineering. I work for Scott at Starbucks. I've been at Starbucks for about a year now. Uh, previously to that, I was also the head of infrastructure and security at Card Free. I was uh, Scott's backfill uh, after he left. Um, yeah, it worked out well. Yeah, it worked out well for me. <laughs> but maybe not so well for him. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so uh, but before I did that, I was actually an engineer. Um, he and I built out that env entire environment from the ground up. Everything from the SAN, physical servers, all the way up to the application and database servers. We own that entire stack, uh, load balancers, firewalls the entire stack. Um, so previously to that, I was at a company called Mercent and then also Tommy Bahama, basically doing DevOps before we knew it was DevOps. A lot of automation, a lot of working with developers uh, very closely, automating all the things. Um, and then that's a photo of me in Pompeii last year. Um, <laughs> Scott really likes that photo. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. Um, so our team over at Starbucks is uh, called the Cloud Foundation Services team. Um, I think it's important for us to note that nothing that we're doing is possible without them. Um, so we like to you know, call that out. Uh, they're a great team of engineers. Um, their backgrounds are in development, operations, security, and big data. Um, some, of us, uh, some of them have joined us from Card Free, a good portion of them from that startup that we helped build. Uh, and then others have joined from Apple and, and AWS. Um, but like I said, really wouldn't be here without, without the support of those engineers. Um, so what we like to talk about is um, you know, the problem that we're attempting to solve with this team. Let me jump, okay. So if you take a look at Starbucks right now, Starbucks doesn't have parity of services around the globe. If you were to use your mobile order and pay application in the United States, and then you were to fly over to Korea and try and use that mobile order and pay app, it's a different experience for you. Um, it actually, um, you know, it lends towards having a poor customer experience. Uh, the reason behind that is because the back end, uh, the back end infrastructure um, that's needed to support that mobile order and pay app is not available in region. Um, so what we're looking to solve with this team is uh, the ability to stamp out that infrastructure, stamp out those environments in a repeatable and secure way um, within those markets and land those services um, uh, you know, much faster than we can do today. So when we took a look at that for the Cloud Foundation Services team, um, we put it really into uh, a business startup and we looked at it from a value proposition perspective. Um, and what we, what we put forth, and it's really what we've aligned under, is that we're looking to build an automated, repeatable, and secure shared platform for Starbucks development teams uh, that allows them to innovate faster and deploy more frequently to their customers around the globe. Um, this is really built upon you know, these four pillars um, that we've uh, been com communicating recently uh, within Starbucks um, to, to other development teams. But really, we're looking to uh, rapidly provision an automated platform within the region. Um, and we're looking to do that um, to, to assist those development teams with getting into market quicker. Um, we believe if we have a standardized environment 
that we're going to be able to increase their velocity once they land within that region uh, for building out those services. Um, one of the other things that we're going to talk about today is security by design. We'll actually spend quite a bit of time on that. Um, but essentially saying that uh, if we bake security into everything that we do, um, then we help to reduce uh, the risk to brand damage um, and also improve the agility of the team um, by trying to prevent security from becoming a blocker as they deploy these services, um, making those controls as transparent as possible and allowing the developers to make uh, the right choice. Um, and then additionally, um, building out an elastic and uh, resilient environment. Um, this allows us to provision and deprovision um, uh, uh, capabilities within that market um, and then save on cost. Um, and we'll, yeah, so yeah, I, I think the other, other key point here is when you're talking about a company like Starbucks, every hour is millions of dollars in transactions lost. We have to have a highly resilient environment in order to keep that uptime because we cannot afford to continue to lose that money. We are a $20 billion company that sells $5 coffee. And that's a lot of transactions that we have to, we have to maintain that ability. Right, so even a few minutes you know, impacts us greatly. Yep. A few minutes is huge. Yep. So shameless plug, we're hiring. <laughs> we're hiring a lot. So we support remote teams. If anybody's interested, please reach out to us. We're doing a really cool project. It's a top five recognized brand in the world and we're rebuilding that platform. It's, it's a really, really intriguing, intriguing project and we'd love to have smart people help us build this. So um, we'll pause real quick, just you know, see if there are any questions around you know, some of the things that uh, we went over there. All right. So DevSecOps, um, you know, I think it's important for us to kind of talk through um, what DevSecOps means to us. Um, the drawings up there, we had to, they were just sketches that we were thinking about, but we, you know, put it in the context of Calvin and Hobbes and, uh, you know, just the security guy kind of sitting over there a little bit, you know, upset. Anyway, um, when, we, when we talk about DevSecOps, Neil McDonald of Gartner, he first coined the, the notion in January 2012. Um, you're starting to see things like a DevSecOps uh, manifesto become available online. Uh, Jim Bird has also authored a, an O'Reilly book. Uh, on this concept, which is DevOpsSec, uh, securing software through continuous delivery. And um, that's actually a free O'Reilly book that you can download, and I do recommend it. Um, and then you're also starting to see uh, numerous white papers starting to show up with this topic. Um, for us, when we take a look at it and, and, and we say, what does it truly mean to us? Uh, it's a way of working, right? So where security is embedded into everything that we do, um, as a development team, we're starting to take accountability for that security, right? Um, to, to put it in the concept of, let's say, dev sec or DevOps, right, which is to not take code and throw it over the wall to an operations team, um, we're saying the same thing with security. Don't take um, that security and throw it over the wall to a security team, right? Actually take accountability for what you're building um, and modify the culture of the organization that you're, you're, you're working in. Um, we talk to large companies that are doing this well. Um, we won't name them, but you know, quite a few of them are based in Seattle. Um, and when we sit down with the developers and we discuss, you know, how are they doing this, um, it's mainly um, the one story that we went through, and I think you can jump into that, Matt. It yeah, was, so we talked, we talked to a development team and we asked them, so what, is, what does DevSecOps mean in, in your organization? And they're a huge organization. Yep. And they, basically security will say, you have a vulnerability in your code and you need to fix it. And it goes up to the level of, if you don't fix it, your service will get shut down. And it's, and it's a publicly available service that would get shut down. And the de development teams essentially have to take ownership of their code in order to get their services fixed. Security, security is there informing them of their vulnerability, but it's actually the development team that has to get it, get it fixed and they're taking ownership. Right, and when we asked them, we said, you know, we were, we were a bit surprised. We were like, are you okay with this? And they said, yeah, you know, this is on me. Um, I, I know that I have to deploy secure services, and um, if the security team has been reaching out to me and I'm not responsive, then it's really on me that the service is gonna be taken down. Some of their actual, like, reviews at the end of the year are based on how secure their, their application is and how many vulnerabilities that they've had or not had. Um, it's, it's a big piece of their culture. Right. 
Um, some of the other things that we've seen, um, and this is really from my, more of my kind of security engineering past, is where the security team is, is invited to that first meeting, right? Um, and uh, during that first meeting, uh, they're asked, hey, what are all your requirements? And that's really tough from like a, you know, an empathy perspective to sit there and have somebody in that room that's trying to do the right thing um, and try and say to them like right up front, what are all your requirements? Um, and then security goes away, right? And then they come back and they say, hey, do I have the green light to deploy, right? And many times security ends up becoming a blocker because they haven't been involved in the process on an iterative basis. Um, they haven't really been in that room. And what many security teams end up doing is um, you know, trying to slow things down, which really is counterproductive to what we're trying to do here, which is to speed things up and to, to rapidly deliver on these solutions. Yep, we believe ultimately that by ad adopting a DevSecOps model, you're actually gonna get code deployed to production faster because security is not gonna be a blocker. You're gonna bake that into your process and it'll ultimately be cheaper because everybody knows that fixing bugs in production is a lot more expensive than fixing bugs in dev. I mean, that's, and it's the same with security. Yeah, so then one last, one last story on this topic. Um, when Matt and I were kind of you know, getting prepared for this presentation, I, I told him about one of my first uh, web application pen tests that I did uh, in, in Philadelphia. And it was for an insurance company um, in Center City. And um, you know, it was one of the first pen tests that I did. And uh, what they essentially did was they brought me in. They wanted me to just kind of hammer away at, at this external site. And um, I saw the framework that they were using. There was a critical vulnerability in it, um, which allowed you to enumerate usernames, right? So I started hitting that, um, hitting that endpoint, and I was able to enumerate usernames. Well, I saw that the usernames that they were using were 10-digit numbers. Uh, and you know, I was a young pen tester at that time, so I didn't put two and two together. You know, insurance company, 10-digit numbers, I'm enumerating a whole bunch of them. I go into the conversation to present the findings. Um, I start walking them through it, and um, I pull up the screen. And it's got all of these, um, you know, these user IDs, 10-digit numbers, and the, the call just went completely silent, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, this is pretty bad. And they're like, well, it's, it's worse than that. These are all social security numbers, <laughs> right? Uh, what they had done was they had, um, for first-time user provisioning, they had put all the social security numbers into a directory service, right? And they said, well, we would use that so that the user could come in, put in their social security number, and then we'd swap it out. But still, in the meantime, all those social security numbers of their customers were, were put into that directory. And I guess the thing, um, you know, when we were talking through it was that if you had a security professional in the room during those discussions, they probably would have said, yeah, I, I don't think you want to do that, right? So it's not the best idea to take those and, and put them in plain text, put them in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You don't know what a pen test is? <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, yeah, so application pen tests, uh, essentially, um, you would, would contract with um, one of the firms. My firm early on was PricewaterhouseCoopers. I was part of their threat and vulnerability management team. Uh, I then worked for Smart Consulting um, outside. Um, and essentially, during that pen test, we would look at uh, an environment. Um, we will look to do our discovery footprint and then hammer away on it to look for vulnerabilities. So if we find something that has been unpatched or you know, they're using an older framework, then you can sit there and, and look for things where you can get sensitive information out of it. Yeah. All right, so um, the abstract of the presentation, um, we put um, security by design in there. And it's something that um, most of the teams at Starbucks that are working with us are becoming more and more familiar with this term. Um, even our, uh, our new SVP mentioned it in one of the talent talks recently, um, and it's something that um, we didn't realize, but we've been doing it for a while, but Amazon actually just recently wrote a, a white paper on it, right? Um, and uh, the term is security by design. Um, AWS, um, you know, uh, basically uh, documented this, this concept in this white paper. And uh, like I said, we've been doing it for a while. So essentially what it is is um, uh, the inheritance of security standards and baseline controls um, to an automated and repeatable cloud architecture. Uh, so the important part of that is it doesn't have to be a cloud architecture. It can be um, on-prem or, or, or any other architecture that you're building out. Um, so if we take a quick look at security by, by design, it has four uh, main phases. And they're, they're pretty simple, right? The first one is to understand your requirements. Second is build a secure environment that fits your requirements. 
Three is enforce the use of secure environment templates. And fourth is to automate validation and remediation activities. So, um, like I said, we've been doing uh, security by design for a while. And in this first phase, understanding your requirements, if we go back to our startup, we actually based our budget at that startup on our security requirements. Um, we had contractual obligations uh, that we had to fulfill, and we also had leadership requirements that we had to hit on. We looked at our first customer contract, and within that contract, it had a, a number of security requirements that we had to adhere to. So when we built out our budget, we actually identified multiple capabilities that we had to put in place. And in that justification line, we put um, PCI requirement numbers um, and then also the contractual obligations that we had to fulfill using those capabilities. Um, so we use those requirements uh, to build our budget and to pitch it to uh, the angel investors and the leaders of that startup. Um, the reason why I bring that up is when you take a look at you know, the architecture drawing that we've got here, um, everything that goes into that drawing is based upon these requirements. If you were to associate to um, uh, building codes, right? And uh, in Seattle, we do a lot of remodeling of our homes. So a lot of us have become very familiar with building codes. Um, but basically, if you take a look at those security requirements and think of them like building codes, it informs our design. Um, so we read through that and it allows us to come up with that drawing of what needs to be in place. Um, so when we take a look at the requirements for our current platform and former, um, we have uh, to build an automated and repeatable security controls, uh, provide transparent defense and depth controls. So those transparent defense and depth controls are for those developers. Um, to essentially you know, assist them with making the right decision. Um, and then we also look to provide an independent third-party audit report to our customers. So when we look at our customers, we actually view our customers as both internal and external. So um, with our startup, uh, within the contract, we would actually say, hey, we're gonna maintain PCI compliance. We're gonna maintain a SOC 2 type 2. And rather than have you come in and audit that, um, we're gonna provide you with that report, which came from an independent third party, right? So that it's, it's got much more strength in, in, that, in that message to say that somebody has come in and they've assessed it. Well, we actually use that internally as well. So within Starbucks, we can have an independent third party come in, assess our environment for PCI compliance and SOC 2 compliance, and we can actually provide that to our, um, to our controller within the company, and we can pro provide it to an internal audit and to our security teams. So it's really taking that accountability of security um, and even the audit that's going to occur and being able to produce that report back to internal organizations. Um, so one of the other requirements we have is a PCI level one service provider. What we're building right now, we have to look towards becoming a, a level one service provider. Um, and if we take a look at those requirements, it's very prescriptive. It, it actually tells us what we have to do um, when we're building out this environment. So if you look at requirement 1.3.1, it's to implement a DMZ to limit inbound traffic to only system components that provide and so on and so forth. Um, so what does this mean to us? It means that we know that we have to have a public and private segment right? So that we have to have essentially a DMZ in an internal segment. So that is something that we have to build into what we're doing. The next requirement that we decided to call out here is requirement 6.4.1. Uh, and this is really to say separate your development test environments from your production environment uh, and enforce that separation with access controls. Uh, so for us, um, that is having a prod and a non-prod environment. Um, and the, the main difference between the two is the data that resides within there and the secrets as well. Um, if you were to take prod data and put it into non-prod, well, guess what? You just created another production environment. And that's how we, um, you know, we distinguish between the two. Other than that, the environments, we believe, need to be almost identical, um, other than potentially secrets. But we've ran into issues in the past where dev and prod were different, and I'm sure everyone in this room has, and that causes a lot of problems. So we're, we're focusing on creating these exactly the same. That's right. Um, so then the second phase, build a secure environment that fits your requirements. Um, for this, um, we basically, we know that we have to do network segmentation. So when we picked out you know, our capabilities, we look at it and we're like, firewalls can do that, security groups. 
Um, we have boundary defense requirements in there. So once again, firewall and intrusion prevention systems. Um, what we've used in the past are UTMs, any place where we can consolidate um, those controls, that primary and secondary control into a single capability, um, assists us with um, you know, the efficiency of that control um, and then also the cost. Um, what we have found though with UTMs right now is that predominantly um, they work really well in uh, where you own the physical appliances, but when you look towards the cloud, a lot of, them, a lot of the vendors haven't really caught up with, um, with what we need to support our architecture. Um, so um, the UTMs don't work quite as nice as, as they did in the past. Yep. Um, and then also uh, a, another, uh, another requirement that we've used, uh, web application firewalls. So layer seven firewalls um, are something that uh, we've been using for a long time. Uh, I actually ended up implementing that in front of starbucks.com. Um, years ago, right? And uh, I think it was one of the first, my first implementations where I had to pull it into full blocking mode. So that was, that was kind of crazy. Um, so then phase three, enforce the use of secure environment templates. This is where we'll actually jump into a little bit of a demo that we can provide. Um, and it's um, essentially saying that once you have um, all of this, um, all of this, all of these requirements, captured and, and how you're gonna implement them, then you have to create a secure services catalog um, and then be able to report, uh, deploy that rapidly via a common pipeline. And then we do that through common templates or, or golden templates for, um, for the deployment and, and the configuration of this. And I think Matt, you were gonna jump in here. Yeah, yeah. so um, we basically, we looked at how we're gonna provision AWS accounts because of the scale that we're doing it, we're gonna have potentially thousands of AWS accounts potentially, and there's a security standard in CIS that says you have to do this, this, and this to secure your AWS accounts. What I have up here is an example of the password policy. So this is a blank password policy that everybody gets in their first AWS account. Um, so we're gonna do a little demo, and I'll talk through about what we're doing and how we're automating um, hardening our account. So if you can click the next one for me. Yep. Um, and one more. Yep. Cool. All right, so does anybody know what Terraform is? Terraform is a, is a tool that allows you to provision and configure cloud, cloud environments and VMware and other, other things declaratively. Um, so what we're showing here is that we have infrastructure as code. We've written our Terraform hardening scripts to meet the CIS standard, and they're kept in Git. So you can see he's doing a Terraform Git. It's pulling it down from our Git repo. And now he's now we're doing uh, we're going to do a Terraform uh, apply here to actually apply these changes. So you'll see a bunch of stuff scroll by. We're configuring CloudTrail. We're configuring logging, SNS queues, password policies, all within a click of a button. Setting up all the logging that we need to maintain our compliance. And this is in real time. And we're able to harden a AWS instance in less than a minute. And it's almost done. Yep. So that's complete. That's how long it takes for us to harden, harden our AWS instances. So if you click Next, you'll see here, this is the screenshot of how we've configured the password policy and how that's been all set up. Password policy is just one example, but there are, are hundreds of, of configurations that need to be done. When I ran through this manually the first time, it took me two hours. And we're able to do it in under a minute. So as we're talking about infrastructure as code and security as code, this is an example of how we're doing this. Yeah, and how many pages is that CIS There's a hundred pages in the CIS benchmark. Right. For AWS. Do you want me to do, the, I'll walk through this one? Yep. yep. Um, so similar application here. Uh, this is for building out our Cassandra clusters. Um, so there are quite a few clicks in this. But essentially what we're saying is um, US West are within one region, right, and three availability zones. Um, within one minute, we're stamping out the servers, um, the OS, and the monitoring packages on uh, nine nodes. So we've deployed uh, nine servers, right? And then um, each one of those servers, we're using an Ubuntu CI, a CIS benchmark hardened image, right? And then we also place down the, the DataStack security, uh, or sorry, yeah, DataStack's enterprise 
um, monitoring packages, and then the security that we're calling out here is the CIS benchmark on those uh, Ubuntu servers. So deploying nine nodes in, in around a minute, I think is yep. where she's at with this. Um, and then in 15 minutes, we're able to set up the networking, the configurations, um, uh, secure the communications between nodes and also between the client and the database. Um, we're able to set up the data encryption, monitoring configuration, and um, alert notifications. I think that's a typo there. Yep, and the alert notifications. And all that can be done in 15 minutes, right? So um, what we actually found when we started stepping into Cassandra was that there wasn't a CIS benchmark. Um, and what you end up having to do here, um, in PCI it's requirement 2.2, and it's all about system hardening procedures. Um, in the absence of a standard, you write your own, right? So it's not something that you would turn to the security team and say, hey, it doesn't exist, so I'm not gonna implement it. You just look at it and you do your research and you author your own standard, and then you get it approved. Um, and then we automate, uh, automate the implementation of that standard. Yeah, I think the key takeaway from this example is not only are we doing operational tasks like setting up the Cassandra cluster for the development teams to use, but we're also securing it at the same time. We're not throwing that security problem over to our security team saying, no, you guys go secure it. No, we're, we're taking that on and we're securing it as, as our team and we're taking that responsibility on. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so then the last phase of this is automate validation and remediation activities. Um, so I don't think we're at the, the automated remediation activity phase yet. We'll get there eventually. Yeah, not, not quite yet. We're, we're working on it. We're working on that one. But um, the concept here is, is uh, you know, it's kind of a traditional security one. It's, it's where you, you configure your, your server or uh, your service, uh, and then you swoop back in with an audit. Uh, we've used Tenable in the past, and it's their configuration audits. Um, you can also use NCircle. They've got CCM, or I guess it's not NCircle anymore. It's Tripwire. Either way. Um, so in this instance, for AWS, we've used Evident I.O. Um, and Evident I.O. Uh, allows you to scan against your AWS instance. Um, you have to provide them with read-only access through an API key. Um, but what it does is it goes through and it checks against all of those CIS benchmarks, right? Right, so the team gets early and often feedback. Every time they make a change in our AWS account, as much as we'd like to, not everything's automated yet, and even things that are will potentially throw up a, a flag. So the team gets immediate feedback. Hey, what you did, that moved away from our standard. You guys need to go fix it. And those notifications get pushed directly to Slack. So taking on a true DevOps where it's early and often feedback and trying to get the teams aware, because like I said earlier, it's cheaper to fix it now than it is in a year from now when we get audited and we go through our, our audits for AWS. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, the, the key piece of this is, is applying that early and often, uh, keeping us honest, right? So we say that we're doing security by design. We have these reports available. We actually make that Evident I.O. dashboard available to our internal security team. So anytime they need to, they can check and see where we're at. Um, giving that, them that visibility um, helps to build a lot of the trust that we need to gain that agility that we also need in the future. Yep, it's important to keep our teams honest Yep, as well. Uh, okay. So yeah, um, those concepts really apply as well to our CI/CD strategy, and then Matt's going to jump in here and, and uh, walk through these. Yeah. So when I came to Starbucks with Scott, we we sat down and we we're like, okay, what we did last time was pretty cool. Like we were pretty proud of what we did. You know, serving up 100 million users and supporting brands like Dunkin' and Taco Bell. But we said, what can we do different? What what were some of the pain points? What were some of the lessons learned? and what can we do better this time and not repeat some of those errors. And the first thing that came to mind for me was CI CD. I was CD at, at our previous company. <laughs> and that sucked. <laughs> uh, I was not going to do that again. So one of the very first things, like the, literally the first technology we started implementing was CI CD. And we wanted to make sure that the development teams were using that early and often. Um, but what we did this time is we also took it a step further. We were implementing uh, GPL scans, vulnerability scans, and what's the other one? Uh, fuzzers. Fuzzers, peach yep. fuzzers. Yeah, yep. to fuzz the ap application to API to make sure that they get early feedback saying, hey, you know, pod bravo, there's a security bug that you guys are getting that you guys should fix now versus in, later in security. 
uh, later in production. Yeah, and I think another important part of that is not modifying the way that the devs work today. So any pipe or any gate that we're putting in should work in a way that we don't have to modify the behavior of our developers, right? We can basically say that this actually fits in or snaps in to what you do today. And yes, it can break a build, but it's going to give you another uh, check, like a unit test. Right. right? Yeah, we're, we're trying to be as transparent to the development teams as possible, but also providing them that feedback. We don't necessarily want to block a build, to, especially to a development environment, because of a security issue, but we probably would to production. We have to work through that with them and how that actually works. But um, it's early and often, and it's baking security into the CICD pipeline. Next. Yep. Ah, application. <laughs> this is Scott's, one of Scott's favorite topics to talk about because he likes to talk about the WAF story that he did at, at Starbucks. Yeah, it's my only, my only claim it's to fame. fame to claim. That's right. Yep. So we, we did implement the WAF at our previous company. It was actually in blocking mode. Um, it was the first thing we bought. It was the first solution that we bought there. Actually. It's Scott's baby. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we, we didn't do a great job of writing the policies there. Like we wrote very high level policies. We did virtual patching. We did the best we could, but we could not get down to a spe specific URI and say that's supposed to be a git and, and block anything that's a put or post. We couldn't get there. We could never get the, de the developer's time to get that level of detail. And you know, for us, we don't know. I mean, I, I have no idea what, what's supposed to be in this URI. Right, and the WAFs try to accommodate for that in a learning mode, right? So it sits there and it tries to profile through um, traffic um, to actually try and figure out what you should do. But everybody gets really scared about flipping that switch to block, right? Because yes, it's got this learning mode, but how much do you trust it? Nobody and, wants to be the ops guy that brought down the website. Yeah, so. So what we're, what we're looking to do at Starbucks is work with the development teams is that they're writing these WAF policies as they go. And there's an API that we're gonna interface with the WAF, WAF so that they can write these policies so that we're not, we're not involved. I mean, we're gonna be there to help and assist and have empathy for them, but you know, that's on them. And we'll, we'll probably put a default deny any any. And if, you get, if the development teams write the policy wrong, yeah, your application's not gonna work. So it's, there's a benefit to them to do that. Yeah, and I think the other benefit is is really around that learning mode, which is um, you know that those those WAFs in the past were always trying to to figure it out the best that they could, um, and it was strange to actually say that somebody who's as an engineer implementing something out in front of a service that they actually didn't have any hand in authoring any of that code, right? Um, which presents a lot of risk about putting something out in front of it. So if we can if we can turn that over to the developers as much as possible, empower them to do that through a self service model. Um, then we're going to get much better policies authored out of it. Yep. Cool. So the, one of the other things we're doing differently uh, this time around is containers. Everybody had way too much access to the root OS. It just wasn't necessary. It, the ops team, the developers, there was too many changes going on in the OS. It was too tough to track. Um, obviously, the benefit of containers allows for isolation. And that gives the developers more, more agility. They're able to put what they need to in the container to make their application run quicker. Uh, part of what we're doing, though, is we're scanning that container through the pipeline. You know, we're, we're looking to say, why did you guys put Java 1.1 on there? That is a ton of vulnerabilities. Why aren't you using the latest version of Java? Or we're signing the container saying, once, it's, once that container's been gone through the pipeline, we know that this container's good, and it's been through the pipeline, and it's safe to deploy to production. So while we're still increasing the agility of the development teams to get code into production, we're also adding, actually adding more security and increasing our security footprint. Um, so we're doing, we're doing container profiling as well, or we will be doing container profiling, where we're looking at the container in development and looking at its interactions and its, and its calls to different other, other containers in the environment. And when we see something different in production, did we miss a unit test or is there something malicious going on? And that for us is a flag where we need to go take action. Anything additional? I think you want to touch on the immutable object. Oh yes, yeah. and then the other, the other aspect that this allows us to do is have immutable ob objects in production. There's no clicky in prod. Everything runs through the CI CD pipeline. And, these, and having containers allows us to do that. It gives us a lot more flexibility and like I said, greater speed to market. Um, overall, it's a huge, for us, it's a huge security tool. Mm -hmm. Even though it's, it's really hot right now in the development world, but we've, 
we've been able to leverage that or we're looking that we can leverage it to increase our security significantly. So we went at a pretty rapid clip, but thank you, and, and do you have any questions? Yeah. So part of that CI and CD process, are you destroying the VMs every time they do a deployment? What do you mean by destroying the VMs? Like destroying the actual machine. Are you rebuilding from scratch every single time? Yeah, so I mean, everything's done in a container, right? So we're, uh, we are bu building the container. Every time that there's a code commit, that container gets built, scanned, and then shoved into our registry. So are you keeping that host alive for those containers? Uh, those hosts auto scale up and down based on the demand um, that, we, that we have. So, so AWS to host those containers? Yes, yes, this environment's in AWS, but this, this theory could be done in VMware just as easily. Yep. It could be done on-prem. And it sounds like you're not in like the desired state for those. Yes. Yeah, I would say that's that's fair statement. We're 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 validating that the container has ha, has no vulnerabilities. You know, what's inside the container, what the development teams are writing, is almost irrelevant to me. Yep. As long you're managing your drift by constantly recreating. The yes. Exactly. There is no drift. Those containers, you know, they're they're all written checked in via Git. Everything's infrastructure is code. There there is no drift. If there's drift, it's intentional. You don't go into the container and make changes. So do you own those, uh, I guess those container repos? Do you have like an internal? The container repo. Yes, we have a internal repo that we're, that Starbucks leverages. Okay. Cool. So one more quick question on Docker uh, security or container security. <coughs> Is that, um, are you guys using Twistlock or something homegrown for <laughs> scanning? And I don't know that I can tell you which vendor we're using, <laughs> but it would be something like Twistlock. Or, or AquaSec or any one of or those. Or AquaSec yeah. or any other vendor yeah, that Yeah, container does. runtime defense. Yes. Like anything like that. I can't yeah. say. Yeah. Not homegrown. Nope. No. We wish we could. Could you, um, could you talk a little bit about the tools that you're using as security quality gates and um, maybe talk about if any of them gave you like build time challenges? Um, well, like I said, I can't talk about a ton of the techno actual technologies we're using because uh, Starbucks Legal may review this. <laughs> and I like the project I'm on. <laughs> um, so maybe we can talk afterwards about the specific technologies. A lot of what we're doing, a lot of what our team's doing is we're taking off-the-shelf products and gluing it together. And that's where a lot of our development happens. It's, it's, we're writing a lot of this in Go and doing a lot of glue code. Right, but Sorry, does that answer your question <laughs> as best as I can without getting fired? Yeah. <laughs> What about like OS versions and hardening the actual OS? Do you have like a team of administrators that do that? Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not all developed. No, so we we take care as a as our team provides everything except for the container to production. So the developers will write their code. I keep motioning to them because they're in the room. The developers will write <laughs> their code, and uh, we provide everything else that's in the environment. So we are securing the OS. Our team is. And we're doing that same as same as everything we've done. You know, we we have an Ansible file for that actually, and right. that's how we lock down our OS with a C, based off a CIS benchmark. The intent is to meet them at the container, right? Um, when you were explaining about the CI process, uh, the one question I'm having is you mentioned about the pain point where authors are not. Uh, the developers are not the authors of the code. So if there are any legacy applications, how are you dealing with that? Uh, legacy applications is an interesting one because we this is a Greenfields deployment for us. Yeah. Uh, we have a unique opportunity to rebuild, essentially, a lot of these commerce applications. Um, I, I do envision how we could handle COTS applications through this. Uh, you know, be a little more high touch for who's ever building that COTS application in the container. Um, but yeah, I mean, it could it it could happen. It's possible. Is that does that answer your question? No, we don't. We currently do not have any COTS applications right now. It's all in or legacy applications. Or legacy. Yeah, everything. we've got a Greenfields implementation for this platform. So actually, uh, Jamie Allen is sitting up front. His team is responsible for for building out uh, the new applications for this environment. It's completely Greenfields for us right now.
Does your team have any dependencies in terms of other organizations, like maybe operations to provision environments or databases or anything like that, or can you do whatever you want? Yeah, you can take that. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we have a lot of autonomy. Um, we're hiring engineers that, that have a very wide variety of skills, and that gives us a lot of autonomy, um, especially being in the cloud. We're a, we are what we call a disconnected cloud. Yep. So we, we have to self-report and self-audit a lot of what we're doing and report back to the security team. Yeah, so a lot of the engineers that we're recruiting, we've kind of put it into to four separate tracks, right? And we look at it and we, we recruit for uh, strengths in development, right? Uh, operations, security, and data, right? And then the, the dev pods that we're building are, are kind of a, a mashup of all of that. Um, so that you have some engineers that are extremely mature in a single track, right? So a lot of the things that we're building when you're saying uh, requirements, we're building most of that ourselves. Um, so we don't have a separate database engineering team that we reach out to in order to do that. If we find that we need to build a Cassandra cluster, that's within our own team. It's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could comment on uh rolling this out in a global organization and, and with transnational coding teams? Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of our biggest challenges. Um, some of the things that we ended up doing right in the beginning was even just our collaboration tools. It wasn't something that we necessarily wanted to sign up for, but we had to. So we ended up deploying our own collaboration tool or you know, setting up our own collaboration tools and our own source code repository. Right now, we are leveraging an external source code repository, but we would move that in-house because the intent is that uh, we want everybody in a single repository that can be stamped out around the globe and we can manage the permissions to it so that they can collaborate on that, uh, on that code on a global basis. Yeah, collaboration is incredibly important in our project and in what we're doing. I believe with DevOps and DevSecOps, collaboration is critical to success. Thank you, that was an excellent presentation. Oh, thanks. Um, I work for Comcast. Okay. Um, coming from, you have a lot more customers than what we have right now. How do you manage the sensitive information across environment? For example, dev and prod, that's one of the challenging points for us. How do you manage without losing its consistency plus also not um, exposing the more sensitive information of the customers to a development environment? Yeah, so for us, that was, um, we were talking about that a little bit earlier about the prod and the non-prod, right? Um, you know, typically you'll find in some organizations they want to take production data and sanitize it and move it into non-prod. And we really steer the teams away from that, right? Which is to say that you should know your application enough uh, to generate the data that you need in order to perform your tests. So when you're performing your tests, we'd like for you to create your users, build out, um, you know, build out that database, and then you can actually com complete your testing. Um, that helps us to say that we're not going to support that migration of that production data into a non-prod environment. Um, that being said, uh, when you start talking about protecting sensitive customer data, there are significant challenges, especially on a global, uh, on a global footprint, right? So when we talk about our S3 bucket policies and when we have that stamped out, we have to make sure that we account for that so that data isn't moving out of a country like, let's say, China or Europe, right? And then especially when you've got GDPR coming up, um, in Europe, right, we have to account for that and make sure that any policies that we write won't allow that data to move out of that region. Um, so these are all the things that we just have to bake in as we go, and I, I'd love to say that we've solved for it right now, um, but we haven't. We see it on the horizon, and we know that we have to come up with something. Um, so once again, we'll fall back upon the knowing our requirements and then building to them. When it comes to uh, procuring tools, do you, if you were to give a percentage, would you say, uh, would you say that you go mostly open source versus uh, commercially available stuff? You want to take that? Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's fine. No, um, that's a fair question. It's yeah. a fair question. <laughs> uh, we've had that discussion internally quite a bit. Yeah. Um, we we tend towards open source, um, but as an operations guy going to production without support or a SME on that product is scary. So we look towards open source and then products that, and then look to companies that will help us support that. We have a very small team, and it's going to be impossible for us to be SBs in the... In every space. In every space, yeah. Yep. 
So you mentioned that you allow your developers access to the your web application firewall. Do you enable them access to routing and your firewall for the routes? So we're not going to enable them access to the web application firewall. We're actually looking towards, um, so you're probably all familiar with a lot of the, the, the providers out there. So traditionally Imperva, right? It's like your number one player in the market. Uh, when we looked at the architecture that um, we're building, um, we need to have more of a distributed web application firewall. So we're looking towards companies like Signal Sciences and others, right? And then how do we open that up and how do we bake in um, those, um, uh, those uh, requirements for kind of a self-service portal for building out those policies. We haven't solved for it yet, but the uh, we have some some really good ideas around it. But they're they're kind of worried about disclosing it. And but the same issue at your load balancer. Yeah, I mean you can talk through some of the load balancer. Yeah, what in general what we're trying to do is we're giving we're trying a lot of the glue code that we're writing is trying to give the developers a common interface to interface with all aspects of the environment, including setting up load balancing WAF. Things like that. That's a lot of the product that my team's trying to build right now. Right, but setting up the necessary bumper rails, right, right. To, to assist with making the right choice, and, that, and that's the true challenge of it is to say, you know, and we say the bumper rails, right, but it, but it's essentially saying that if you want to do a allow any any uh, inbound um, on that uh, boundary, uh, we're probably not going to allow that, and make sure that we've got the automated controls to prevent that from happening. Hi. Um, once you get a, a like a project or a feature deployed to production, how do you manage churn on your engineering team? Um, you know, or how do you how do you keep the developers engaged in the DevOps or DevSecOps model where they don't just kind of walk away and then you're stuck? It's kind of funny because Jamie's sitting right here, so we could he could jump up and tell you about that. <laughs> Um, we've had a lot of conversations around this, which is to say that uh, you build it, you run it. It's it's the same um, you know motto or um, that um, AWS has been saying for a while, right? So when we look at the services that are out there, um, if Jamie and team have built that service, they run it. Um, we have uh, downstream services that they consume, right? So if they're using DNS, if they're using our pipeline, we own that. We provide the availability of that service, the health of that service. Um, but if they are rolling something like loyalty or rewards, that is on uh, the application engineering team. Uh, and it's an agreement between the teams. It's a contract between the teams that we have to uphold. And you build it, you run it, you secure it. Yeah, we've added that to Based it on this presentation. <laughs> So you guys using any uh, container management frameworks yet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to get fired, so I'm not going to tell you which one. Talk to me afterwards, I'll let you know. Yes, we are. We've we spent a lot of time looking at container management, container scheduling, and yeah. orchestration. It's it's a critical piece of what we're doing. Right. Um, but I don't want to say which one. No, that's all right. I mean, yeah. We spent a lot of time looking at them. We really like, you know, Kubernetes and Tectonics. I mean, it's a, it's a good framework. Yep. All right. You said it, not me. That's right. Question? Any other? No, no I don't want no. to talk about that one. <laughs> that we won't. Um, for any of us working at companies smaller than Starbucks mm -hmm. um, that maybe don't have as, you know, even though your team's small, a lot of us have smaller teams. Yep. Um, what's the highest bang for your buck sort of stuff? You know, I guess also, like, I don't have a thousand environments, I have two, you know? Sure. I, you know, this entire conversation when it comes back to it, it's really around misconfiguration, right? Because when you look at a lot of the security issues that are out there, it usually lands around misconfi misconfiguration of your services, right? So um, you don't have uh, a lot of money to spend. Uh, spend a lot of time up front looking at that configuration, making sure that you're comfortable with it and deploying it in a repeatable fashion. Yeah, um, I think that's one of the strongest things that you can do. Yeah, I think for us, because when we started at our startup, it was, it was just, just us two. It was just us two, and we, yep. we hit PCI. And for us, bake it in from the beginning. Start with security. Your security, like, you start with your security requirements, and then you start with your, then you go to your ops, and then your de development requirements. You have to start with security. It's the only way you're going to hit, be able to do that with a small team. And yeah. then automation. Yeah. Uh, automation, it's so worth it. 
We were at, um, oh, there's a question, but I'll just, uh, we were at reInvent this year and there was actually somebody presenting on DevSecOps as well. And his assertion was saying, actually we should be calling it SecDevOps. He still, and his reason wasn't to be that security um, you know, always has to be out in front or always in the limelight. It was just that if you, if you do that first, then it's gonna set you up for you know, potential better success, right? So putting security out front would assist in that. When you say uh, you secure it, or the dev teams are supposed to secure it, uh, what, what are the expectations for security around like microservices and uh, service to service calls, URL, URI uh, service uh, security? And, and do you have anything that enforces that? Um, it's a good question. We're, uh, we're looking at several different options there in mm -hmm. terms of how we're gonna do service to service security. Yep. Um, you know, Google has talked a lot about how they do mutual TLS between all their services, and that's something we're, we're looking at doing. Um, yeah, the software defined perimeter. The software, the, yep, exactly. of that. Exactly, so instead of using ACLs like in the past, we're looking at more of a software defined perimeter. Um, still flushing that out exactly though. And then validating that, you know, that's, that's easy enough to write a script that well, it's the validation of it, it. yeah, and then and essentially, um, if you look at a software-defined perimeter, nothing should respond, right? So unless I can authenticate to you. So if I do a discovery scan and something responds, then um, we've got an issue, right? So that might be one way that we could approach it. Uh, we do the mutual TLS, then the next piece of it is the cert management. That becomes really difficult, and um, it's another thing that we'll have to solve for. For us, though, we want to try to make it as transparent as possible to the development team so they don't have to worry about it. And that's, that's a problem that our team's trying to Because trying nobody to likes managing certs. Nobody likes managing certs. <laughs> nobody wants to deal with TLS, especially developers. No offense. Yeah. <laughs> but. Thank you. You've talked a lot about uh, contracts and agreements between teams and holding each other accountable. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, perhaps give a couple of best practices about, around doing that and perhaps one lesson learned? Yeah. Um, one of the things that we've been doing with CFS is uh, we basically wrote them down. That's like one of the easiest things, but a lot of people don't do that, right? Which is to say, what are the core tenets of landing in our environment and what are we agreeing to as a team? And then socializing that with, with the development teams. We do that through lunch and learns and, and talks, right? Um, but it's really just being as transparent as possible um, and then getting the buy-in from our leaders within our organization to enforce that. Right. Yeah, I would say for me, the most important thing is empathy. Both ways. I have to have empathy for the development team and they need to have empathy for my team. And that is something that we're in a, a culture we're tr still trying to instill in our, in our teams. You know, like, hey, I know they don't know Kubernetes, they don't know kubectl, I get it, but you gotta help them. You gotta get them, you gotta get them functional because in the long run, you teach them that and you don't have to do it again. Teach them to fish, don't hand them a fish. But, so, <laughs> oh, the teach the man to fish? Teach the man to fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? I was just curious yeah. if you could comment on key management. Key management? Yeah. Just what, a general question? Just in or? general? Or yeah. what, what about it? Anything specific? Or? Uh, pain points, your approach. State of today. Yeah, so we're still building um, some of that, some of that infrastructure. Um, we are trying to solve how you automatically rotate keys, um, specifically SSL keys. Um, what we're trying to do is everything's automated, right? Everything, there's no, like I said, there's no clicky in prod, there's no managing keys. Keys and secrets should be automatically rotated and updated. Um, how we're specifically doing that, uh, still working it out and uh, I don't know how much of it I can say about. No, we're still working it out. I mean, I think the biggest challenge for us is really with the secrets management and how we're gonna do that. Um, giving the developers what access they need in the environment so that they can perform their testing that we're not preventing them from, from uh, basically troubleshooting, right? But then once it gets to production, the developers don't even want knowledge of that information. So how do we provide it to them in a way that they can consume where they don't need um, the information itself. Um, so we're working through that, we're architecting it out. Um, I think right now it's just looking at those requirements and making sure that whatever we build supports those, 
those assertions. This is sort of uh, loosely associated with security, but we've got a requirement that's been placed on us to provide an asset management function for our infrastructure so that, you know, when we're talking about hundreds of environments, thousands of VMs, that you know which development team to go talk to when something goes down or something's compromised. Have you had that requirement placed on you, and if so, how have you solved it? Yeah, so that's the inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices requirement that you usually see come out of uh, SANS, right? Yeah, that's a SANS requirement. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's particularly challenging now when we start talking about containers and short-lived um, instances, right? Um, so we've been looking at it from a registry perspective. How do we capture that? Um, we're, you can talk to yeah, us Yeah, we're, we're looking at a tagging strategy yep. um, where we will tag a container or an EC2 instance or, or even an environment that gets tagged. And for us, it's a cost thing. Like I have to show cost back to Team X and show cost back to Team Y and say, this is your cost, you pay us this, and this is your cost. Um, so we're using a tagging strategy at the long run in AWS. Right, and then for that chargeback model, yep. How did you arrive at this sort of build it, run it culture, or did you always have it? We arrived at it at our startup, to be honest with you. When Matt was telling you about, he was Matt, he, yeah, well, no, when he was Matt CD, right? Um, that, that concept is, you know, that's, that's an AWS concept. You build it, you run it. Um, I'm trying to, Jamie, you remember, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the gentleman so who. Adopted across the board as part of it? No, no. no. This, is, no. this is our team yeah. uh, and working with Jamie's team closely that are trying to build this culture. We're, we're, trying, to, we're trying something new at Starbucks, quite honestly, and we're, yes. we're going we're gonna to succeed and we're going to try to build, change the culture of some of the IT there. Yeah, we're hoping that we can prove it out. Um, and uh, really, it, it requires a, a team that believes in it to adopt that culture. And um, if we get some successes, then hopefully we can expand that out to the rest of the organization. Any other questions? We got a few more minutes. Do we? Oh, we've got two minutes. <laughs> Hi, great presentation, by the way. Oh, thank Didn't you. Didn't think I'd learned so much uh, today. This is great. Um, given that you're a single team, kind of just um, you know serving as a you know a sole unit, where is that? I'm having trouble envisioning that delineation between where um, provisioning ends for a developer and kind of begins from a security or from like the the other standpoint. Uh, sure. So for us, right now, a developer commits code to GitHub, and from, that, from there, our CI CD pipeline picks it up, and that should end into a deployment into a, an environment uh, based on our branching strategy. So we work very closely with the development teams to make sure that our services are up and they're meeting their needs, um, but that's, I mean, it's, we meet them at the code, like code layer. Pipeline. Okay. Yeah. No, we, we, we would love for them to participate. I need more help. So any time they want to do a pull request, they're welcome to and they're encouraged to. Specifically on the CICD, we're, we would love for them to do pull requests and, and help make it better. It's, it's all open. It's all the same repo. I mean, everything we do with them is shared. Some of them are. I mean, when yeah. you actually look towards you know, some of the members of Jamie's team, they are contributing to the infrastructure as code, um, which is actually hugely helpful, right? Uh, we, we try to foster that, which is to say, if you do see a problem and you know the fix, right, um, then, you know, submit pull request and, you know, let's get that implemented. Um, yeah, yeah it's tr we're trying to collaborate and break down the walls between the two teams. So similarly, if there was a security bug and we had a more mature security team, we would love to be able to submit pull requests like, here, here's how you fix that. Right. But we're, we're not there yet from a maturity standpoint. Any other questions? Or? I think we're at time. Sweet. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.